Good morning, Serenity. Isn't it good to be in his house? Where have y'all been? It's good to see you folks today, and we welcome to Serenity Baptist Church. We got a few announcements. We want to get these out of the way this morning. One, we finished our continued class that we were doing on Thursday nights, and we will start another one in the next few months. So please be mindful of that. Our ladies' Bible study is still going on, and it is at 10 a.m. on Thursday mornings. On April the 17th, we have Easter Sunday. There will be a gift for all the kids that are here that day. But we want you to come back, be part of that on Resurrection Sunday as we honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it was one thing for Him to die for our sin, right? But what sealed the deal was the resurrection. And we thank the Lord for that. Ladies, we will be serving you breakfast on May the 7th at 10 a.m. in honor of Mother's Day, which is on May the 8th, and there'll be a gift for every one of the ladies. Those ladies that would like to go to Wilmington to the ladies' conference, if you would please sign up in the back on the table up against the wall in the lobby. And the money is due on the 24th of, of May, uh, April. So please be mindful of that. Our seniors, we will be have graduation Sunday on May the 22nd. And then, of course, we have our car show and Father's Day and all kinds of stuff coming up in the near future. But on the 13th, Wednesday the 13th, we will be having our Lord's Supper that Wednesday evening before Easter, okay? We are certainly glad that you are here. Make yourself at home here at Serenity Baptist Church. Getting on. stand if you would please y'all ready to praise the lord this morning amen who loves you serenity amen lord loves you let's sing it God be the lord.
word of prayer. Remember each and every one that is on our prayer list. And if you would, please keep Linda Wood in prayer uh, for our church folks. She just went into cardiac arrest and they're trying to revive her. So if you would, please be with Richard. Ask the Lord to be with Richard as he's headed over to the hospital, okay? And let's just ask the Lord to meet with us in a special way. God is good and he can take care of things, can he not? Amen. As we learned in Sunday school this morning. But let's ask the Lord to meet with us in a special way and the blessed today and that he would have his will and way in our lives. Brother Terry Patterson, would you lead us in prayer, uh, prayer please? Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We're excited for you to be here today. And uh, if this is your very first time here at Serenity Baptist Church, you did not get a visitor's card when you came in, would you just lift your hand up? We might have a record of your visit. Down here in the front, Brother Terry, he looked at me and goes, I had to go get more pins. And then right over here also. Anybody over in this section? All right. We get you all taken care of here. Brother Terry, right over there too. Right over there. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. You're our honored guest. We appreciate you being here. We know you could have gone anywhere today. But uh, we do not take it lightly that you're with us here at Serenity Baptist this morning. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope to be a blessing to you today. Uh, we are getting ready to have our penny march. This is just loose change we collect for our kids, and we use it for their activities and things of that sort. But uh, you fill that card out, if you would, and place it in these plates. The kids will be passing in just a few moments but our tithe boxes are in the back. Visitors, you are not obligated. Church folk, we got to pay the bills, okay? So if you would, our tithe boxes are in the back of the auditorium. And please make use of those. In just a moment, our kids will be passing those plates. And you can either put that card in one of the tithe boxes in the back of the auditorium or in the plate as it goes by. So Brother Warren, if you would, come with the penny march, please.
there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free, and my shame is Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be
We need Him every day. Don't think for one second that we can go about our life as if God does not exist. We need Him each and every moment of every day. Hey, we are glad to have our visitors with us today, and they've been invited by folks. So we wanted to see who brought the most visitors today, okay? So if you brought over five, raise your hand. Four? You got five? How many you got, Brother Roy? You got six visitors with you? And you got five? Anybody over six? We appreciate you bringing visitors with you today. We have a $50 gift card to Longhorn Steakhouse. Okay? So you're going to be out 10 bucks because you're going to give each one of them $10 of that, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for bringing the visitors today. We are, again, so appreciative that you are here. Brother Mike, if you'd come lead us in another song, please. Stand again if you would, please.
one more song. All right. Okay. You paid it all. Amen. He paid it all on Calvary's cross for you and me. seat folks thank you now he molded and he built a small lonely hill that he knew would be called He grew the seed that would grow to be the thorns that would make his whole son bleed. And he grew the stem and gave it leaves. And he Tree that he. Could 
stayed with his plan. He grew the tree that we might go free. He grew the tree that he knew would be used to make that old rugged cross, that old cross, it was Calvary's cross. It is our privilege this morning to have Brother Mike Frazier, pastor of Canton Baptist Temple, with us. And we had him scheduled last year. We ended up with COVID. We had to shut the church down for a couple of weeks. And uh, I am grateful that his schedule was open to where we could have him this week. And um, I have appreciated Brother Frazier and the work there at Canton and the work that he's done with the Baptist Church Ministry Network. And um, he has become our friends here at Serenity, and I appreciate that very much. And Brother Mike, you come and preach this morning what the Lord's laid on your heart, but we're grateful you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. Well, it's good to finally be here. Am I on? Yep, I'm on. Very good. It's finally good to be here at Serenity Baptist Church. I hated whenever your pastor called me that week and said, we are sick with COVID and we're going to have to cancel uh, the speaking engagement, but I certainly understood. All of us were dealing with that issue in our churches, and uh, it's good to be here today. I've enjoyed the music here today, amen? Enjoyed the wonderful special, and uh, I wish my wife could be here. She is actually the pianist at our church. And so I so appreciate the instrumentalists, uh, the pianist that played today, and then uh, the drummer over here. Did you see his socks? <laughs> Did any of you see his socks? Man, he had some hot pink socks. I think they were hamburgers. Were they hamburgers? There you go. I had to keep looking at them. I have to admit, I wasn't always paying attention. I was really focused on them socks to see uh, what was on there, but hamburger socks, yeah. Made me hungry already for lunch, amen. But uh, I really appreciate this church, and as the president of the Baptist Church Ministry Network, I want to thank you for your monthly financial support of that ministry, and we are making a difference all across America, and uh, we're excited about what the Lord is doing there. And then when I was back there walking through the hallways, I noticed you had uh, some missionary prayer letters that were up on the wall, and you support one of our missionaries sent out of... Canton Baptist Temple. We have 14 missionaries sent out of our church around the world, but you support Brett and Katie Anderson over in the country of Spain. They are out of our church, and I want to thank you on their behalf. Thank you for financially supporting them, and uh, they are now on their first year there on the mission field and still learning the language and learning the culture, and we're excited about what the Lord has for them uh, down the road. Well, it, it is a blessing to be able to preach, and I always count it an honor, no matter where I am, to be able to preach the Word of God. Amen. I grew up on the mission field of Japan. I was born in Japan. My mom says I have Made in Japan stamped on me somewhere, but um, I was born there, lived there 17 years, and uh, came back for college, and uh, my parents uh, served the Lord faithfully there. And uh, my dad always said, no matter what size of group that you preach to, always count it a privilege and an honor to be able to preach the Word of God. And I'm just so excited to be here today. And uh, if you have a Bible, I want you to open it to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to get to uh, chapter 5 here in just a moment. In John chapter 12 and verse 21... You may remember that the Bible says that there were certain Greeks who came to Philip and asked him, Sir, we would see Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. When I, I pastored for 
uh, eight years in East Ridge, Tennessee. Anybody from Tennessee around here? Uh, all right, there's a hand that went up. Uh, East Ridge is right outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I pastored eight years before I, I moved up to Northeast Ohio. And boy, oh boy, I, I really like the winters down in Tennessee better than I do the winters in Canton, Ohio. But I've been up there 23 years now. Uh, but when I was there in uh, East Ridge, I pastored the Stanley Heights Baptist Church. And right there on our pulpit, right, right across the, the top of the pulpit there, was that statement, Sir, we would see Jesus. And it was a constant reminder for every preacher. It was a constant reminder for me every Sunday when I got behind the pulpit. But everybody got behind that pulpit. It was a reminder that more than anything else, people need to hear about Jesus. And it was also a great reminder to every preacher that that's our job. That's our job. It is the preacher's job to point people to Jesus. And that's what I want to do in this message today. Uh, the book that I hold in my hand today is the Holy Bible. It is God's very Word. And I'm reminded that it is, in a sense, one book, but it is a library of 66 books from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And it was written over a span of 1,500 years by over uh, 40 different human authors, even though we know that God and His Holy Spirit is ultimately the author of the Bible. But when you read and when you study the Bible, you quickly realize that from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that the main person of the Bible is Jesus Christ. And the main message of the Bible, the theme of the Bible, is redemption. So from the very first chapter of the Bible, from Genesis chapter 1, all the way to the very last chapter of the Bible, there in the book of Revelation, there is like a, a crimson cord that stretches across every page of the Bible. The resounding message of the Bible is the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ for the sins of all humanity. John the Baptist, whenever he saw Jesus coming, uh, he literally summed up in one sentence the essence of what we preach week in and week out. John chapter 1 verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's the message that I know your dear pastor preaches and what I preach there in Canton week after week after week. Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so in today's message, I want to speak to you a few minutes here today about Jesus our sacrifice. Jesus our sacrifice. Look, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read about three verses here. Uh, one here in 1 Corinthians 5, and then we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible today, don't worry. The verses will appear on the screen, and you'll be able to follow along with the message here today. 1 Corinthians 5, look at the very last statement in verse 7. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now look, if you will, at Hebrews chapter 9. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and look at the last half of that verse. Hebrews 9, verse 26. But now once in the end of the world hath He, that is, Jesus Christ, hath He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. Look at the very next chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 12, but this man, referring again to Jesus Christ, he was 100% God, but at the same time, he was 100% human. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. We don't read about a sacrifice in the Bible until we read about man's sin in Genesis chapter 3. It was after the fall of man that we find a blood sacrifice being made by God on behalf of Adam and Eve in Genesis 
chapter 3 and verse 21. You remember how Adam and Eve had tried to cover themselves with fig leaves back in verse 7. But as the prophet Jeremiah says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Let me remind you today that no amount of good works can undo our sinful nature or restore our relationship with God. No amount of good works can erase the sin that is in our lives or redeem us from the bondage of sin. Listen to me because there could not be any other covering but the covering of that sacrifice. Because before there could be a covering for Adam and Eve's sin, there had to be a sacrifice according to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. And that first sacrifice was an innocent animal pointing to that future cross, that cross on Mount Calvary where Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would become our sacrifice. I agree with Arthur Pink, the late Bible expositor, that when he says here we find the first gospel message preached by God, not in words, but in symbol and in action. What we learn from Genesis chapter 3 is that man in his own efforts cannot fix the sin problem. People all around the world are trying to fix their sin problem. And I want you to know today there's a big difference between religion and a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. All around the world you have religion. Uh, my dear friend, we don't need any more religion in the world today. Religion is man trying to reach up to God. But the message that we find in the Bible is a message of redemption. And that is God reaching down to man. I heard a preacher recently say, and I, I agreed with it. I actually wrote it in the back of my Bible. It says the symbol of Christianity is not a ladder, but it's a cross. Whenever I look back here behind the baptistry here, there is a symbol of the cross. Can you imagine having a ladder there today? <laughs> so that's crazy. You're exactly right. But so many people around the world almost view religion as a ladder to where they're trying to climb their way to heaven. And that is not the story that we have in the Bible. In the Bible we read about how the message is a message of redemption. God sending His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and then died as our sacrifice on that old rugged cross. And the Bible says that He was buried, and then He conquered death in the grave with His victorious resurrection. That's what we're going to celebrate here in a couple of weeks. The fact that we serve and we worship a risen Savior. When we look at Genesis 3 again, we learn that man cannot fix his own sin problem. We also learn that there is a need for a sacrifice. And then you come to Exodus chapter 12 where we have described for us a sacrifice that was to be slain for the deliverance of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. It was called the Lord's Passover. And it was again a foretype of Jesus Christ who became our sacrifice. We know this is true because of the verse that I just read to you a few minutes ago. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 For even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. Isaiah 53 also gives us a picture of Jesus Christ our sacrifice. Isaiah 53 verse 7 He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. All throughout the Bible we see that there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be the shedding of blood, the death of the innocent for the guilty. And that is what we see a picture of all throughout the Old Testament until we see that ultimate sacrifice that was made for your sin and my sin, for the sins of the world. And that is when Jesus Christ suffered and bled and He died on that old rugged cross. 
Now here this morning, I want you to think with me about four points about our sacrifice. So if you're in the habit of taking notes, I want you to jot down four things. Number one, Jesus was a sinless sacrifice. We need to understand that Jesus Christ was and is the very Son of God. And because He is God, He is perfect and He is without sin. There is verse after verse that teaches the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, you can't buy your way into heaven. Amen? You cannot buy your way into heaven from your vain conversation or your lifestyle. You're not going to get in heaven because you've been a good person. There's no person good enough to go to God's heaven. And then it goes on, received by tradition from your fathers. You say, well, I grew up in a Christian home. Well, so did I. Thank God we grew up in Christian homes. But growing up in a Christian home doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven when you die. It is a personal decision that each of us has to make. Then in verse 19 you see these words, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That statement emphasizing that Jesus Christ was without sin. 1 Peter 2 and verse 22, who did no sin, referring to Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And now we uh, know from the book of Hebrews as well that it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. It would take a man to become the sacrifice for a man. And yet one sinful man could not be offered as a sacrifice for another sinful man. You say, why is that, preacher? Because the first sinful man would be simply dying for his own sin. He could not die for the sin of another man. He was dying for his own sin. Listen to me closely. If Jesus had even committed even one sin, he would have been an unacceptable sacrifice in the eyes of God. The beloved disciple, the Apostle John, emphatically says, in him is no sin. Being fully God, 100% God, he was sinless. And yet being fully man, he was able to die as our sacrifice. You can't die for my sin. I can't die for your sin. But Jesus Christ died for both of us. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says that he offered himself without spot to God. That Greek word that is translated spot means fault, blemish, or blame. Jesus was without fault. Jesus was without blemish. Jesus was without blame. And there hanging on that old rugged cross, He became, the Bible says, sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I want you to know that Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, perfect, sinless, he died on the cross not for any sin that he had committed, but he died for your sin and for my sin. He died for the sins of all humanity. But number two, not only was he a sinless sacrifice, but he was a substitutionary sacrifice. Now much like the word Trinity, the word substitution is not in the Bible. And yet, the concept is clearly taught. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but we do believe very clearly that the Bible teaches that there is one God, and yet there are three persons in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the same way, we don't have the word substitution in the Bible, but over and over again throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, we see the whole concept of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Listen to Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. But he, referring to Jesus Christ, was wounded. For whose transgressions? For his? No. 
The Bible says he was wounded for who? Our transgressions. He was bruised for his iniquities? No, he didn't die for any sin that he had committed, but rather it was our transgressions, our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of who? Of us all. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for what? The unjust. Boy that describes us right? Dirty rotten sinners unjust it was the just the perfect son of God dying for sinners that he might bring us to God the only way to have a relationship with God is through his son Jesus Christ that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened or made alive by the spirit has the thought sunk deep down in your soul that Jesus died in your place for your sin. Has that hit you? He died in your place. We deserve to die. We deserve to suffer eternal separation from God. But Jesus became our substitutionary sacrifice. We deserve to die and to burn in hell forever. But Jesus became our substitutionary sacrifice. Just like in Genesis chapter 22 where God provided a ram to die in Isaac's place on Mount Moriah, God provided His Son Jesus Christ to die in our place on Mount Calvary. He died so that we might go from death to life from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, and from spiritual bondage to spiritual freedom. Do you realize because of our faith in Christ and what He accomplished as our substitutionary sacrifice, we are now the children of God and heaven is our home, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. If we had a thousand lives, it would not be enough to repay Him for His substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf. Number three, Jesus was a surrendered sacrifice. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 says this, And being found fashion as a man, in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, the first half of that verse, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He hath laid down His life for us. Jesus did not go kicking and screaming to the cross, and neither did the Roman soldiers take His life, but rather the Bible teaches He willingly gave Himself as a ransom for all. Long before He was arrested, long before He was crucified, Jesus expressed the fact that He was a surrendered sacrifice. Listen to John chapter 10. In my morning devotions today, I was reading John chapter 10, and here's this verse. Therefore doth my Father love me, Jesus says, because I what? I laid down my life that I might take it again. Nobody took the life from Jesus. Jesus laid down His life as a sacrifice for you and me. It was God the Father's will for God the Son to die for our sins. But I want you to know that God the Father did not force God the Son to die. The fact that He was what? Obedient meant that humanly speaking He had a choice and that means that He chose to die for your sin and my sin. John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus again says, No man taketh it from me. No person's going to take my life away from me. But I, what, lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. That is the crucifixion. That is what we celebrate on Good Friday. And then it says, And I have power to take it again. That's what we celebrate on Easter. The fact that He is a living Savior. This commandment have I received of my Father. I want you to know that 
Jesus was your sinless sacrifice. He was your substitutionary sacrifice, meaning that He died in your place on that old rugged cross, but also He was a surrendered sacrifice. He willingly died for you and for me. Number four, Jesus was a sufficient sacrifice. The sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice for all people is wrapped up in the little Greek word called pas, P-A-S. Now, I realize, and I said this during Sunday school class, that most people in churches today do not care about the Greek or the Hebrew. I get that. My dad had an earned doctorate. He had his Ph.D. in New Testament text. And so uh, he was sort of a scholar when it came to Greek, and he forced me to learn Greek when I was a young boy, when it came summertime and I wanted to go out and play, he said, well, first you got to get your Greek classes done. And boy, you talk about boring as a teenager having to go through all that. But now that I look back, I'm, I'm now called into ministry, been pastoring for 31 years, and uh, I realized, wow, that was a blessing. I want to point something out to you, all right? You got your Bible? Have you got it? Hopefully you bring a Bible to church, all right? I want to show you some verses, and I want to talk about this little word called Pas, because pas is a Greek word that carries the idea of totality, totality, all of it, all right? Uh, last night, uh, your dear pastor and his wife uh, took me to a restaurant called Chewy's, Chewy's. Only the second time I've ever been to Chewy's in my life. One other time, my wife and I tried it there. Uh, we were in Polaris around Columbus, this sort of a one-day getaway, and we went to Chewy's. And uh, he took me there last night. And I want you to know that I cleaned everything off my plate. I ate it all, in other words. I was dealing with indigestion last night, amen. But I ate it all. It would be that word, pas, the totality. Everything that was on the plate when they brought it out to me was completely gone. That's one of the curses that my, my mom and dad, they said, you eat everything on your plate. And I have been doing that to this day. And uh, it's become a real problem that I'm eating everything on my plate. But let's talk about this word pas just for a minute. Because when it comes to the use of the word, the Greek word pas, in the context of salvation, it emphasizes that salvation is for anyone, anywhere, at any time. Right? When you uh, took on the Andersons for financial support, you believed that Jesus died for the people that were living in the country of Spain. And that if Brett and Katie would take the gospel of Jesus Christ there, they'd have the opportunity over there to hear what Jesus had done for them. And we believe that's important. We believe in the great commission of preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why? Because we believe in this little Greek word called pas, totality. It means in the context when you read about it, dealing with salvation, it always deals with anyone, anywhere, at any time. Let's look at some verses. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Because the fact that Jesus was a sufficient sacrifice can be seen in several verses in the New Testament. Look at Hebrews 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. In other words, he had to take on humanity so that he could die for us. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for Every man. That word every is the little Greek word pas. P-A-S. It means that he tasted death. He experienced the death of all people when he died upon that cross. I want you to look at 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 Timothy 4 verse 10. For therefore... Paul is saying, this is why we serve the Lord. This is why we do what we do. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. Pos, that little word pos there, translated all. Who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. He died for the sins of all people, but you have to believe. You have to put your faith, your trust in Christ alone to save you. 
I do not believe in the limited atonement of Jesus Christ. But rather I believe that Jesus died for all. Pos, he died for anyone, anywhere, at any time. You say, well, I believe Jesus just died for the elect. Well, on the authority of the Bible, I disagree with you. Let me read to you Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, who was that offense of one? Adam. That's what we read about back in uh, Genesis, the fall of man, Adam. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon how many men? All. Oh, that's that little Greek word, pos. Came upon all men to condemnation. Every last one of us are sinners by nature because we are descendants of Adam and we are also sinners by action. So by nature and by action, we fall into that category. Not one person. Do you realize that you cannot take the gospel to the wrong address? Have you thought about that? You cannot take the gospel to the wrong person and say, Oh, I'm sorry, the gospel wasn't meant for you. No, the gospel was meant for all people because all people need the gospel. All people need Jesus. And it goes on, even so by the righteousness of one. The first one was dealing with Adam, right? The first Adam. Now we come to the last Adam. Who was the last Adam? Jesus. Even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon how many? All. All people are sinners. And by the way, Jesus died for all. <laughs> and so it, we see here that he died for all men unto justification of life. The gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of our sin is extended to all pos because all pos are sinners under condemnation. Now that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. But it does mean that the sacrifice of himself that Jesus made on the cross is sufficient enough to save every human being. You say, I'm still not convinced, preacher. Do you believe that this book from cover to cover is the Word of God? I do. This is the Bible. As I said earlier, one book, and yet it's a library of 66 books. If you are a Bible-believing Christian today, then you would say, I believe the Bible is the very Word of God from cover to cover. Can I tell you one of the reasons we believe that statement to be true is because of that little Greek word, pos? You say, oh man, I thought you were through with that word. Well, we're not yet. I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse 16. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All Scripture. <laughs> Guess what word that is? Pos. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now when we see those two words, all Scripture, we don't say, well, all Scripture except First and Second Chronicles. I'm reading through the Bible we, uh, at our church. Um, we read through the entire New Testament one year. Last year we read through the entire Old Testament and this year we're reading through the entire Old and New Testament. And so as I mentioned earlier, I'm re reading the Gospel of John, but I'm also in the book of 1 Chronicles. Can I tell you, there's some tough names in the book of 1 Chronicles. How many of you have been reading 1 Chronicles? Man, oh man, you read that and you go, wow. But since you and I believe that the Bible, the entire Bible, is the Word of God, we say that what? All Scripture. And all Scripture means all 66 books. The whole canon of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is the very Word of God. Amen. Now back to a couple of verses that I, I read a little bit earlier. 1 Timothy, uh, you're in 2 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. For there is one God. I don't care what our culture teaches today, there is one God. Yep. There's not a multiplicity of gods. 
But there is only one true living God. And then there is one mediator between God and men. Here on this side you have a holy God. Over here you have unholy men. How does a holy God and unholy men have a relationship? Well, there has to be a, a mediator. Job said there's not a daysman. There's no mediator. Well, there's a mediator. We read about him in the New Testament. And it is the man Christ Jesus. Only Jesus can give you that relationship that you need with a holy God. And the reason why is because He became your sacrifice on that old rugged cross. Because the Bible says in verse 6, Who gave Himself a ransom, and there's that word, for all to be testified in due time. That all-embracing adjective there, pas, Stressing the fact that there are no limits to whom Jesus died for. On the authority of God's Word, the Bible, I want you to know that Jesus died for your sins. I want you to know that. You say, well, I guess He died for His sin and I guess He died for her sin. I want you to know He died for your sin. He was your sinless sacrifice. He was your substitutionary sacrifice. He died in your place on that old rugged cross. He suffered your separation from God. That's why God the Father looked down and, and, and turned His back on Jesus. And Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? He was your surrendered sacrifice. He willingly laid down His life and He died for you. And He is your sufficient sacrifice. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus living a good life. It's not Jesus plus church membership. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that can forgive you of your sin, give you the gift of eternal life, and promise you a home in heaven. It is only Jesus who can save you. And the Bible says that if you will repent of your sin and receive Him by faith as your personal Savior, He will save you. Amen. Romans 10 verse 13 says, For whosoever, whosoever, are you a whosoever? You are. Whosoever means anybody. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have not made that important life-changing decision, I want to encourage you to do that today. I want you to know that you are not here today by accident. You are here today because God wanted you to be here. You are here today by divine appointment. God knew that you needed to hear this message today. You needed the opportunity to receive by faith Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I would encourage you, don't walk out these doors the same way that you came in. God will save you. God will transform you. I don't care what kind of sin you've committed in your past. I don't care what walk of life you come from. I want you to know that God loves you and He sent His Son Jesus to die for you. And today if you'll put your faith, your trust in Him, He will gloriously save you and He will transform you with His resurrecting power. But the choice is yours. You either reject Christ as the way of salvation, or you receive Christ as the way of salvation. What will be your decision today? Will you stand with me, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Hooker, and he will lead this invitation however he sees fit here today. But if you need to make a spiritual decision for Christ, I pray that God will give you the courage to do that today. If you'll take the first step, I promise you that He'll lead you the rest of the way. Yes. Heavenly Father, thank You for sending us Jesus. Yes. Oh, how grateful we are for Your Son, Jesus, who died for our sins. We shudder to think about where we would be today without Him. Thank you that through Him we have the forgiveness of all of our sin. Through Him we have been made your children. 
Because of Him, Lord, you have broken the chains of bondage and you have set us free in Christ. Lord, all because of Jesus, we have the gift of eternal life. We now have a relationship with you all because of what Jesus did for us. We have the promise of heaven. We have the promise that all that we need is in you because of Christ being in us. And so God, I pray if there's one person here today that needs to repent of their sin and by faith receive your son Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, I pray that they would humble themselves, Lord, and realize that there is no way that they can save themselves and that they would submit themselves to you today and receive you by faith. I pray for other spiritual decisions that need to be made. Maybe there's some people here today that are saved, but they've never taken that first step of obedience and been scripturally baptized by immersion. And I pray, Lord, that you might give them the courage to make that decision. I pray for others here today that maybe they've been visiting this church now for a number of weeks or months, and, and you've given them peace today about identifying with this fellowship of believers, this local church, and they would say, I want to I wanna belong here. I want to be a part of this church family. I want to serve the Lord here and worship here. Lord, if you've given them peace about becoming a member of this church, I pray that they would step forward and present themselves today. I pray for that individual who maybe is a Christian but is backslidden today. Maybe they are not living for you and today you've worked in their heart. I pray, God, that you would bring them to the altar and may they make that decision that will change the direction of their lives in these upcoming days. Lord, we commit this invitation to you and we pray for your perfect will to be accomplished. For it's in Christ's name we pray.